you're hosting the Oscars. <laughs> That's the way I see it. Um, this is as close as I'll ever be to hosting the Oscars. Only without the musical hook to get you off the stage. Yeah, well, we we could we have the technology. Um, welcome to the afternoon session, first afternoon session of our little workshop, and Susan will uh, introduce the next speaker. Thank you. So our next speaker is Carol Cromhansel, and I'm just so delighted to have Carol here. I mean, Carol is really one of the reasons I'm a psychologist. Um, I first met Carol in 1983, I think, when you were at the Center for Behavioral Studies at Stanford. Was that when you were writing your book? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So she came out, I met her, I was, I was working at Atari Research at the time, and I was trying to figure out, I was casting about thinking, ah, grad school, hmm, computer science maybe, or linguistics maybe, psychology maybe, and so I met Carol, and she really convinced me that I thought like a psychologist, because I would come up to Carol and say, hey, I learned this weird thing in psychology, and she would say, you think like a psychologist, so she convinced me to crash the Stanford <laughs> psych colloquia, and I truly figured it out, and so, um, so I was first, uh, drawn to Roger Shepard, who is Carol's advisor. Roger is one of these visionary people in psychology. He was really the perfect advisor for Carol, because I think Carol is <coughs> more visionary than Roger, because in a sense, I think of Carol as one of the founders of this field of musical music cognition. I, at least that's my image of her. Of course, I knew her as a, a wonderful person before I even knew her as a great scientist. So anyway, so Carol is professor of psychology at Cornell. Um, and she actually went to grad school twice, and I love that too. I went to grad school a couple of times because you never get, if you love school, you just want to be in school all the time. But <laughs> Carol first started in math psych, and then she did cognitive psychology at Stanford with Roger. She's extraordinarily creative, and her curiosity is, has led her to study um, the links between um, music and emotion, as well as music as a link between cognition and emotion, as well as <coughs> um, different uh, music processing across cultures, and also all of those real basic mainstream cognitive psychology topics, but with respect to music, which isn't mainstream at all. And so she'll be talking today about um, music and memory. Um, she'll, she's received awards such as the Society for Music Perception and Cognition's Achievement Award, um, and they say this is to recognize outstanding contributions to the field of music perception and cognition. Um, she's known as one of the earliest people to apply rigorous quantitative approaches to both experiment design and analysis in order to illuminate the perceptual and cognitive principles understanding the experience of music. Um, so she's a real pioneer, and um, I'm just really happy to have her here. <laughs> well, it's great to see Susan. She's a, as soon as she wrote to me saying, I could come to this thing, and, oh, sure, of course, because <laughs> I've never been here, I've never seen you here in your natural habitat. <laughs> and I'm really happy to be here for uh, the conference and everything. Okay, so I was uh, told that this was going to be very informal, so here goes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's more informal than <laughs> okay. uh, <clears throat> So, if any of you have known my work in the past, it's been at the cognitive end of things. And when I began this work with my colleagues like 35 years ago, the project was to try to understand what the internal representations for music were. Um, <clears throat> and to show that it isn't just like a tape recording, right? That there were really cognitive concepts. And we drew a lot on music theory to guide us in what to look for. So there are things like scale, <coughs> harmony, tonality, and melodic and harmonic expectations, which you know has something to do very importantly with the emotional responses. And then more abstract concepts like style, and uh, this was studied both in, um, you know, Western tonal harmonic music, but also atonal music and cross-cultural music. So today I go to the far extreme and talk about veridical memory, very, very precise long-term memory for specific works of music. Um, <clears throat> just to give you a sense of what the earlier work was, things about the relationship between keys and how that relates to how Chords are organized. We heard this wonderful chord cadence, which I wish you'd finished the last one before. And then the tonal hierarchy. Um, and uh, just, I don't know if this is a good thing to play. Give you a flavor 
flavor of how abstract a concept of style can be. Uh, this is a piece of pe uh, piece that's written on a completely unique principle. And uh, so what we did in this experiment, play the first half, and then people heard little probes. And the probes could come with the part they heard, or from the rest of the piece that they hadn't heard. And they were able to tell what might happen later in the piece. And then they could re re mess it up in various ways, and they were able to reject those. So it says just even one hearing. And we did this six times to see if they would improve. They got it the very first time. So I just mentioned that, because some of this work was really much more abstract than um, uh, the theory of music would uh, lead us to look at. Uh, this I'll come back to later. <clears throat> this is sort of the culmination of this line of work, and it was with Fred Laird all, and I want to talk about it at the end because I think it might have the most um, interest, at least I have the most interest in talking with linguists about this particular project. Okay, so here we are <clears throat> at the other end, veridical, precise, very long-term memory, specific pieces of music, and we're using popular music. So here's the idea, here's what they heard in the experiment. is that if you can recognize it, that means in your mind, in your brain somewhere, somehow, you have a representation of that piece of music that is so precise that you can match up that little tiny acoustic bit with that memory. So that's the point, trying to study how precise this is. Uh, so that's what I'm trying to show you. You got this thing in your brain. <laughs> so this is sort of patterned after Malcolm Gladwell's playing and uh, actually Amity and Rosenthal in the social psychology world have um, talked, uh, shown how people could pick up a lot of social cues in very, very short <coughs> slices, not as short as the three <coughs> milliseconds. <clears throat> Jernigan and Parrot it was one of the other influences. <clears throat> they took 10 genres of uh, <clears throat> popular music, and played very short segments, and people agreed with themselves. Now, style is sort of subjective, it changes over time, so that's where they use self-agreement. So when they, what they said for the small uh, clips did it agree with the longer ones. So here's the experiment we did. Um, <clears throat> uh, we chose 52 top songs. And we selected eight because we had the recordings. <laughs> Nothing very systematic. <clears throat> and we took two clips per song. One was from the chorus. And one was from some other place. And we uh, coded as to whether there was a word in it or not. <laughs> and for the linguist, you notice how much information, linguistic information, you can pack in the first couple of seconds, yeah. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to. Oh. Um, this, I, it's either me or PowerPoint. It's PowerPoint. Yeah. Oh. You can get it, right? Do we have? This? So, um, we didn't want to just know whether they could recognize it, we wanted to understand something about how memory for music is organized. So we asked a whole bunch of questions. Artist, title, how confident are you in those? Uh, the decade it was released, and the style, and we used a, a previous study that had classified into four different style categories. So we used those. And the emotional content, happiness, sadness, and fear and tenderness, which are really crude, but they've been used in other music course, uh, music uh, studies. So um, we got a uh, rank order here. You can show, see Britney Spears. Yeah. 
And not only that, let's see, where is she again? She also comes up uh, with, with an encore. Um, <clears throat> but as I said, I played you Jimi Hendrix before. Um, well, I, Aretha I've played too. Um, so they're able to recognize on a scale from one to six, they're confident at the level 5.3, and they're right when they're confident. And that's, uh, oh yes, and when they know the artist, they know the title and vice versa, they hardly ever know just one. Uh, yeah, there was a small but not significant difference between things that were taken from the chorus and things that were taken someplace else, but there was an effect of whether there was a word or part word from the uh, title of the song. Okay, and then this is the metacognition part. <clears throat> it was really interesting. You know, if you look at most confidence ratings, they'll be bunched around the middle of the scale. Well, here we get this really strong bimodal pattern. Um, they said they knew it, or basically they said they didn't know it. And when they knew it, they knew it. If they said six, the confident top end of the scale, they were right 95% of the time. And when they said six, they were don't get backwards. Anyway, you get the point. Uh, so you have this very conscious, explicit recall of factual information. And <clears throat> decade of release. A slope of one, an intercept of zero. I mean, they really, really, really know what decade these songs come from. So they probably know a lot of things. Uh, also, the artist's biography, what the album cover looks like. They know what the, uh, how the punctuation was. Uh, song is don't stop believing, you know, <laughs> all sorts of things. <clears throat> but okay, what about the people who didn't know it? So we could divide this. They still knew something about the decade when the song was released. Could have to do with uh, the recording engineering or something, but they have an impression of the style of different decades. Um, <clears throat> and also, we can see whether they agreed with the people who knew the song in terms of the emotional content. So the way we did this was count the number of people uh, on the one trial, as people said they really didn't know it, uh, that gave different responses to happiness, sad, anger, fear. And we did the same thing for the people who really knew it. And you can see, it's just a made up example here, if the patterns agree, then you'll get a high correlation between them. And here's the result. You can see most of the correlations are positive, way, significantly way uh, larger than zero. So even if they don't recognize the song, they still have an impression of the emotion. I'll skip that. And they have the same thing with the style. They agree. So something is getting through under the cover of that explicit knowledge of what the song is. <clears throat> Okay, so just to summarize, you have this explicit knowledge when they recognize it, artist title, decade, totally intertwined, all packed together, but still an impression of, without knowing it, of the decade of release and the emotional content and the style. So, what do we know about the uh, ecology of people listening to popular music? Well, <clears throat> Uh, and what does this mean? Okay, so at the rate of 25%, 25% of the time they got both artist and title. They would recognize 100 clips per song for a three minute song by artist, title, and, and release decade. And when they knew the song, it just sort of said they, they knew all this. So what, what's going on? What was their background? They listened to 21 point, these are chronological pages, so they listened to 21.7 hours per week. Which, if you do the math, means that they hear 22,000 songs a year. Obviously, there are many repetitions. We can't really listen. Maybe we got on their iPods, iPads and counted their, but anyway, you know what I mean. Uh, so, <clears throat> there was one student who said he had a year's worth of music on his computer, and he knew those, about 60% of those was about as well as the ones in the experiment. So, that means he would recognize. 10 million auditory clicks like So, I know, for the neuroscientists here, so I, I would really like to know how the brain does this. Now, <clears throat> Susan mentioned uh, my great uh, <laughs> advisor at Stanford Graduate Shepherd, and this was really in the back of my mind. All these years, I wanted to do an experiment like this. 
And so this is a, he, he was interested in studying visual memory, the capacity of visual memory. And what he did was uh, show people 612 pictures of common objects on slides, quick fast. And then they, they were tested later with two pictures. Which one did you see before? And they were correct 96% of the time. Somewhat better than words or sentences. So I, that made a huge impression on me. And so I'm trying to think, how to do an experiment like his with just little pieces. So can you tell, can you match up uh, the artist with the small, you maybe can't see it well enough. Um, <clears throat> any guesses? The top one. Uh, this one? This one, you can tell which uh, artist? I can't tell which one. It's probably that. You have to point at Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, I talk about it. <laughs> OK, this image, do you know what artist? Is that one? Uh, no, I actually know. This one? Cool guy. I don't think this is working. <laughs> well, I tell you what, so you can say. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. So the problems with I don't know what paintings to choose. I don't know. Uh, but artist and style would be appropriate. I don't even know um, who to test. I don't know what people's familiar are. So I haven't done that. <clears throat> but I have done something with movies now. These are short segments. Now I really have a PowerPoint failure, so bear with me. Uh, these are movies. We took 11 frames from them, same duration as the music clips. And they were asked a bunch of questions about them. Okay, so be prepared. Okay, that one works sort of. Okay, so here's the here's the design. I'll show you some more in a minute. Uh, what are the basic questions? Again, how much detail? What kinds of information is in memory? Suddenly we got some background information about how often they go to the movies and uh, personal associations. With the next thing I'm going to talk about is a study of autobiographical memories associated with popular music. But So this is sort of related to that. Uh, we did a preliminary study to um, find out what movies people might know. And uh, we looked at three databases and asked our students which ones they would uh, most often recognize, would know, and so on. Uh, unfortunately, Cornell's students go by box office ratings more than other kinds of critics or whatever. All right, so these were the movies we came up with, and as I said, 11 frames, about 460 milliseconds. We took them from the trailers because they were readily available. Uh, which means that the music uh, isn't relevant. They put different music for our trailers. So th these were presented without any sound. Um, <clears throat> the uh, student who's working on this uh, with me uh, chose a section that he thought was a signature section from that movie, and one that uh, was just random. It was a number, number generated and took 11 frames. This is sort of like chorus, non-chorus is the idea. <clears throat> and we asked the name of the movie and how confident they were, and then what the um, emotional content was and what the style was, what the genre was. Okay. <laughs> okay, so these may or may not work. Right. You've got to imagine this. They, it, the, you know, I, I tried to do this um, in PowerPoint. There's a bright white screen, and then this comes on, and this is followed immediately by another bright white screen. So it's very short. You, this is a ridiculous. Thing. Right. <laughs> 
Okay, then we saw long clips were like four seconds long, and we asked some more questions. The one from before, but how many actors they knew in the movies, how many times they've seen the movie, uh, whether they liked it, and so on. I, ha I just got that full set of data analyzed like Monday. No, to be honest, Thursday. Um, but So I don't know some of the answers here. But So here's a long clip. <coughs> Let me go back and try. And you guess the Titanic is the winner. <laughs> and so, uh, Let's see, what are, these are the percentage of people who recognize them by name. <clears throat> and so here's some of the worst and some of the best. And um, there's, well, I'll, I'll get to it, I guess I'll put it later, but the signature ones are the ones that are more often recognized. So here there is a difference depending on uh, the confidence. Again, they were really, same by modal kind of thing. And when they said six, they were correct 99.7% of the time. And even when they said five, they were very, very correct. So they know when they know it. So again, very conscious, explicit recall of factual information. And they agree with each other and the emotional content. And they also agree with what people say about the long clips. And interestingly, uh, the signature agreement with the emotion is hardly any, statistically, no higher than the uh, random clips agree with the long clips. So again, it's like this, this other stuff is getting under the cover of this explicit knowledge. So how do they know they recognize actors, characters, specific events, unique objects, and so on? They can recognize actors, they um, average 6.2 actors per film, and when they haven't seen the movie, they still know what it is. And uh, you can see some of the statistics. I've seen them on average one point of times. They like the ones they've seen. And they have personal memories associated with them. Not always, but I asked them what kinds of personal memories. And it was growing up family. It was very frequent. Uh, recently with friends. In other words, I know who they see these movies with. And also another thing I'll get into later is that early experience with the, in the family is important. So there's some various parallels. And, and the general point is I'm really interested in this type of memory that not only is so precise, but also people can be so confident about it. And I also think there's sort of an emotional reaction associated with getting it, right? And uh, I think maybe it's a shock that you can do it. And it's a flows in the whole thing. I mean, you know, where you were, uh, how you danced, uh, all these things come in at once. So then um, <clears throat> there was an unexpected, turning to the third study, there was an unexpected finding in this. Now, the, the songs were that, you know, chosen that uh, carefully. But we did find this thing where people, these students actually like the older songs more. And you could be the 60s songs, which is <laughs> um, but the general phenomenon in studies like this is that people have lifelong preferences for the music that they heard during late adolescence and early adulthood. Maybe it's hormonal changes, maybe it's social um, uh, identity, maybe it's becoming independent, maybe it's you just hear it a lot in the dorm or whatever. <clears throat> So uh, this is a study that was done in 1989. It's very good. Uh, it took 10 top billboard hits from 1932 to 1986, and they played the music, 30-second excerpts, nice rich ones. They uh, had people 16 to 86 years old. And uh, what they've shown in this graph is how old the person was when the song was popular. <laughs> and uh, so you've got people who are 80, five and they're just hearing the most recent music and they don't like it. And people are very young and they're hearing the old music and they don't like it. But in between there's this preference for songs that 
were first popular when in early, late adolescence and early adulthood. So, but that doesn't fit with this preference for the older ones. So, this kind of result, this is a study where people are asked when they first encountered their favorite book, movie, record. And uh, so this is the distribution. People re refer to those things that they first experienced when they were at the same age. <clears throat> so, okay, turn on the sound. <laughs> so we took, and this is more systematic now, um, we took the top two board hits for five year periods from 1955 to 2010. <clears throat> because I'll test your age. Your friend there with you, you'll have to go. whether you like it. Um, there is the typical increase as they get towards their 20s, which the students are, but also there's this very distinct <laughs> And so this is completely different than what's been found in the literature. And there's something going down on down here in the 60s. So let's look at that a little bit more closely. Um, <clears throat> this is asking about whether they have personal memories and the context of those personal memories. And you can see that they have a lot of personal memories associated with all the music and the music that was released before they were born as well as the recent music. Um, they were listening with their parents less as they were growing up and more with uh, alone and with, uh, uh, and with uh, friends. Uh, the the uh, personal memories that recently they're hardly any. You know, um, they're not associating recent personal memories uh, with the older music, which means they're probably not listening to it anymore. Okay, so one of the questions is, a, is it just a matter of uh, frequency? And there are various things I won't necessarily get into about why we can suggest that isn't probably the, the main factor. Um, let's see, want to hear some more? This is... Quality, but we got quality judgments, and there's not a big 
increase for the quality of judgments. So it may not be that. It could be it's the grandparents' music. So anyway, just to remind you of these great songs. <laughs> feel energized, which is a, a sort of a surrogate for whether they feel like dancing, right? Anyway, now there's an earlier study that uh, was done by Shulkin, Hennis, and Rubin uh, with the same kind of design except over 10-year periods. And they still got the same bump. Now, they thought it was because of music of the 60s, which is better, which of course, <laughs> but also it was their parents, so that might be good. Uh, okay, I think we don't need to. Okay. So these are the students I collaborated with, and they're great to work with. Now I wanted to come back. This is kind of serious, but um, <clears throat> this is sort of the end of this work I work, uh, did with about tonality, and it was work with uh, Fred Laird. I sort of felt like this was the best I could do in this regard. Um, <clears throat> obviously, a lot of you were. Uh, know about the earlier book that Fred Lerdahl wrote with Ray Jack and Dorothy Linguist, Fred Lerdahl being a theorist and composer. <clears throat> and he wrote this book, it's called um, Modern, <laughs> um, oh Total Fish Things, thank you, gosh. Um, <clears throat> and it's a really precise, quantitative theory that builds on decades of research about similarity relationships and total hierarchies, key relationships, and he's quantified it using that information, but also bringing in this idea of a tree structure. And this is where I'm really reaching out to the, the linguists uh, to uh, try to make a connection if possible. So the tree structure represents the relationship between the events that are harmonically related, <coughs> related in the key context, and also have um, relationships in terms of the distances between their tonal hierarchies. And it has the property, well, okay, it has the property that events are not necessarily, often mostly not, connected to adjacent events. Okay. So the non-adjacent dependencies are very, very prominent in these representations. It also has a big feature where um, if, a, if the tree, the short line connects to the long line up here, that means this is a tensing, increase in tension. And if it's the opposite, it's a decrease in tension, like the, the end of the caves. <clears throat> so all these numbers go together to make predictions of the amount of tension that someone would experience during a piece of music. Now this is just one of the three, one of three segments of the Chopin. And notice, now you start getting this really tensing. Now we're getting to our Predicted uh, tension uh, is, is the dash line <coughs> for that one uh, phrase, and the judgments are at the solid line. It, it, the slider starts at the bottom of the end, so that's the discrepancy. And then for the second phrase,
for, my time is well over, but thank you very much. <laughs>
No, let's talk about that. I mean, you can maybe use eye movement data, but I don't know how much we have to base that on. I mean, you could just put them through different spatial frequency filters and then yeah. see if uh -huh. it's still distinctive uh -huh. or not, and then you could find the, the kind of critical sample for each one. I, I was really interested in the, um, the different uh, the different factors that you noticed reinforced particular memories around songs, such as um, family, uh, where you were with friends, and that it seemed, at least in the data, that you said that recent associations a bit of a drop off. And I was wondering if you thought that, that might be related to like a larger socioeconomic sphere with what goes on with music. Because as an avid music collector, and in Mojo magazine from England does a similar thing. They ask celebrities, where were you, what's your favorite, what, the, where, where were you when you bought your first single? And people remember this. Yeah, I, they, and they know exactly where they went. But I've never heard anybody say that was a fantastic download. I just had. <laughs> <laughs> unless, uh, unless, unless, unless it's an event, like when Radiohead did their surprise pre-release sort of thing, which made it like the store, but, but it wasn't. And and so I wonder if over time those types of those those types of reinforcements for certain memories are going to change because it's what use somebody's going to do with that download later, listening with it from the friends. It's going to reinforce it, not so much where you you know. Because where you are is probably at your computer, and that blends into everything. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's changing so fast. Yeah. I feel frustrated, you know, you throw the pieces. But uh, Justin Zutnick, uh, who did the um, reminiscence <coughs> uh, paper with me, uh, is interested in social choice. And people do share, they, uh, share their new music with other people. They communicate in the social networks about music they like and they people have music only friends on facebook mm -hmm. and he's looked at it if you get to be friends with someone because you like similar music and then it turns out you don't like them they're jerks you still keep up with them so he's been looking at some of the factors so the social networking thing may carry some of this episodic information but probably not with the same um i, I remember someone was talking music department said, I remember the block I was on when I heard this on the yeah. radio for the first time. Mm -hmm. Well, those experiences are much more distinctive. So, you know, when we experience the same kind of thing over and over again, it gradually becomes a semantic memory and we lose the ability to tell the episodes apart. And so, you know, downloading and paying for things online, I mean, it's all the same. You don't yeah. really have any different right. environmental cues. You're still in the same room with the same computer. Whatever. Whereas I think you know, you remember I saved up from babysitting to buy the cow yeah. seals. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I remember when I'm really embarrassing myself now. But anyway, you know, or the monkey's record that was the other one, right? And so you know, you have all these other cues. So it, it's just an episodic memory thing, really. I think yeah. that the different media, um, the more distinct the context, yeah. the stronger it's going to be. Someone asked when you were uh, revising this paper about whether the old memories for the old music are more uh, semantic than episodic. I mean, I've been collecting them and they say no. I remember I was driving with my aunt and da 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 da. So they have very specific uh, memories associated with the music that was uh, released before they were born. Thank you.